Harsh is Sunil speaking. I can hear him. Yeah, he said a few words. Yeah, I I, I have been speaking. Uh, Pramod looks look, looks like. And you can see him. Yes, I can see him. I can see you. You're chewing something. <laughs> <laughs> having a piece of chocolate. Okay. Not, not only can we see you having chocolate, we could also see the cereal going on at the back. I don't know why I can't hear him. He still can't hear me. Hmm. So we were enjoying the cereal while you went to close the windows. <laughs> <laughs> it's a cricket match. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, now we have a real problem now. Can you start, please? Yes, please. Let's start off. So there's a there's an echo coming on your system. It's gone off now. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, uh, Mrs. Sunil Khan Munjal, Session Chair, Past President, Ima and Chairman, Hero Enterprise. Mr. Harshwadhar Neotia, Past President, Ima and Chairman, Ambuja Neotia Group. Mr. Pramod Basin, Chairman, Clicks Capital Services. Ladies and gentlemen, we are still awaiting our uh, final speaker, Mr. Suresh Prabhu, who will join us. I can't uh, hear her at all. During the event. It is a pleasure to have you with us in this special IM session on the changing economy and geopolitics of Asia and India's evolving place and role in it. AIMA has been a partner of Horasis for many years, and this is another opportunity for AIMA to put forth an Indian perspective on global and regional issues from the Horasis platform. We are privileged to have four very distinguished Indians on the panel, and we look forward to an exciting and meaningful discussion on a matter of interest to all Asians. I will wait for Mr. Prabhu to join us, but uh, he has been India Sherpa to G7 and G20 and has witnessed the changing shape of engagement among the leading countries during the last decade. He has, he has had a long run in the Indian Parliament and the Union Government and has led many key ministries, including Ministry of Commerce and Industry, Ministry of Civil Aviation and Ministry of Power. He is highly regarded as a reformist and a very efficient politician. Mr. Munjal, many thanks for agreeing to moderate the session. You are a multifaceted business leader with interests beyond business. You have played a central role in the creation of a more successful motorcycle company, and now you are a key investor mentor to many of India's unicorn startups. You have a flourishing real estate, steel and corporate services business, and you are a co-founder and chancellor of one of India's modern private universities. You are a popular spokesperson for Indian industry on all matters of interest, including India's strategic affairs. It's a great pleasure to have you and a warm welcome to you. Mr. Nyotia, it's great to have you in this discussion. You lead one of India's prominent business groups and you're renowned for your innovations in the housing and real estate sector. You founded India's Housing, you you founded uh, India's first public-private partnership for affordable housing, and you received one of the highest national awards, the Padma Shri, for your efforts. You've also invested in socially important sectors such as healthcare and education, and you're a patron of Indian art and culture. You're a keen observer of the big picture of the national and international politics, and you bring significant gravitas to any discussion on the subject. A very warm welcome to you. Pramod, Many thanks for joining the panel at short notice. You know the intricacies of navigating national economies across Asia better than most, and it would be great to have your inputs on the emerging geopolitical trends in Asia and the impact on global business. You've done business across the world, both as a professional and as an entrepreneur, and you actively track international economic and political issues. We would love to hear your views on how India can deal with the shift of global focus to Asia and capitalize on it. A warm welcome to you. Ladies and gentlemen, since the dawn of the Asian century, India has increased its engagement with Asia substantially, especially with the East and Southeast Asia. India has become conscious of its centrality for stability in Asia and wants to play a more pivotal role in shaping the Asian century. However, as Asia gets more prosperous and its nations become proud, there are signs that the Asian century would not be an entirely happy and peaceful affair. The new strength of Asian nations have revived nationalistic power and all disputes are resurfacing. Asia is becoming less predictable and a great game is on in earnest to set a new hierarchy on the continent and settle claims, including rewriting histories and redrawing maps. 
in the new environment in Asia, India has to engage more and play a more meaningful role in guaranteeing peace and stability in the region so that Asia can continue to focus on prosperity and progress and not squander its gains of the recent decades by reviving its past quarrels. With these words, it is now my pleasure to hand over the session to the chairman and the moderator, moderator of the uh, session today, Mr. Sunil Kanpunjal. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Rekha. Uh, thank you for setting up such a wonderful session uh, along with Horasis. I think this is a subject which is gaining more and more importance, uh, more particularly in recent times. Uh, I was reading Rudyard Kipling's famous novel, Kim. It was wonderful how he captured that there was a hand behind every curtain and a knife in every hand. The literal cloak and dagger of geopolitics was captured in a wonderful earthy manner, uh, talking about what was going on in the 19th century with, with this kind of war of uh, attaining supremacy in Asia between Great Britain uh, and Russia. And we've seen this transform over a time. The world has moved from a bipolar world to a unipolar world to an attempt at a multipolar world. And now we are seeing those pulls and pushes shift again, exactly as, as Rekha just said. We are seeing a lot of action now take place in Asia itself. Uh, for many uh, decades now, the belief was that this century will be Asia's century. And there will be two big poles here. Uh, while we have two big economies, Japan and Singapore, but they exert less influence in geopolitics than it looks like China and India want to. And it's also clear that China wants to be a single pole and not a bi bipolar universe in Asia. Uh, therefore, uh, that causes the added complications that we're seeing in recent times. Uh, also, the changes taking place in West Asia further complicate this issue. So uh, I, I hope and wish that Suresh Prabhu had joined us by now because he has a wonderful strategic view of what's going on here, both from the perspective of government, think tanks, from trade and, and, and geopolitics. Uh, nevertheless, I will, I will start with my two co-panelists, uh, both outstanding individuals. I don't need to introduce them because Rekha just did. Um, so... Let me uh, start with you uh, uh, first, Harsh. Uh, China, using three decades of military and economic muscle buildup, is trying to alter both the land borders and sea borders. Of course, they said they are not doing this. Uh, but there are many historians which say that China has been expansionist through history. Now, how much is fact, how much is, is fiction, how much is, is real, how much is shades of, of reality, uh, I think uh, only time will, will tell us. And there are a number of smaller countries now which have started to shift uh, allegiance either towards China or away from China. And what do you think this means for Asia right now? Thank you, Sunil Bhai. <clears throat> well, it's quite evident that China is uh, creating a churn in the oceans around it. It's also evident that we are moving towards some kind of a partial cold war between the US and China. And obviously, we see China also sniping at our borders and therefore there's an uneasy truce between India and China. So, clearly, they have a design. We don't know because we know that it's a rather opaque society, uh, fairly secretive, and therefore we don't know exactly how this will manifest. But it would be naive not to believe that there is something afoot there which is uh, troublesome, to say the least. Now... Recently, we saw also China take some measures against some of their best-known business groups. And they have a debt crisis in some of their major companies like uh, Evergrande, etc. So, the world is definitely re-evaluating 
it's very strong honeymoon with China over the last 30 years. And I get a sense from talking and reading articles that there is a, a serious move to relocate some of their bases, both manufacturing and services bases, from China to other countries. In this context, India clearly is extremely well poised to attract a lion's share of this dislocation that will happen. Okay, let me let me this to, to to Pramod now. Uh, Pramod, uh, exactly as as Harsh is saying, India in a sense needs to secure its interests and its positioning in the new reality, whether it's through uh, economic influence, military influence. Uh, making friends in the right places. Incidentally, many of India's old friends and allies are now becoming China's new friends and allies. And and uh, so the question now is, what does India need to do in the region? And I'm not at this moment only referring to the, the U.S. centricity that is taking place, which, by the way, I think overall from the economic and geopolitics is good, uh, also as a balancing factor. But what do you think needs to happen in the neighborhood? Because India has been blamed for two different two things at different times. One is that it's a very nice, quiet, simple big brother. Second is that it tends to bully the smaller countries. Where do you think the reality lies and what's the path forward for India? So, Neil, thank you for having me and uh, really appreciate it. Uh, really wonderful panel one. And what an important point for discussion for all of us, even though uh, we may not be geopolitical experts, but certainly from an economic and, 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 and every other aspect of our lives, this is of deep interest. So I think your question is exactly on point, Sunil. Um, but I will, if you will allow me, go to the U.S.-India-China equation also first. Oh, of, course, of course, by the way, that, that is very much part of what's in play. You know, because it, that's actually going to be the key driver. The fact is that China is ascendancy is going to cause increasingly strident protests across the Western nations. That is something when I visit the U.S., it becomes blindingly obvious, the almost blind uh, dislike and distaste for everything Chinese uh, at this point in time. And you're seeing it. Uh, in politics, you're seeing it in people, you're seeing it in a view of the world which is threatened by China enormously. So I think that's a very rising force that will continue. And while Biden, the president, is trying to balance it out with saying, hey, we will confront you on all your aggressive tactics, but at the same time continue to do trade with you. I think that question in itself is going to be questioned by manufacturing, by the politics of America, and that will cause even greater tension. There are other elements about China's aggression which are quite obvious and quite late. Um, you know, I've spent a lot of time in China, Sunil, uh, setting up the entire GenPact operation there. Must have visited 50 times. We started the whole, like we started the operation in Gurgaon for the IT services component, we started it in Dalian, Dalian also, well before people. And the Chinese are also extremely proud, extremely independent, very the most, they're the most capitalistic country in the world uh, that I know of under this communist umbrella that they sit under. So it's a remarkable, uh, as you know, it's a remarkable uh, a contradiction all co coexisting. But, you know, President Xi has come out quite clearly and said that the re reunification of Taiwan is going to be one of his goals in the next three to five years. That's a huge step a statement that he's made. And the ramification, the implication just point to even more fractures. For India, it's a fantastic time to bridge, rebuild old bridges. So, you know, when we opted out of some of the regional cooperation movements, I was actually personally sad because I thought this would be a moment for us to actually take the lead. For instance, services economies are the ones that are growing in most of these countries, including India. And we could have combined very well together with trade in those areas to build a very robust cooperative model. Because right now, China is moving in there. And because the West is rebuffing it, it is increasing its presence. So one, I think we must do that. Two, I think we have a chance as a country to redouble our efforts with the Western countries 
to show them that as a democracy, with shared values and all of those things, that we are actually the best long-term partners. And to some extent, if I say it really badly, extract our pound of flesh from them of saying, we've been support, we've been like this all these years, you've supported all sorts of people, now is the time for you to help us do what we need to do. Lastly, Sunil, I would just make the point, from an economic perspective, you know, I, I think we missed a bit of the bus, the manufacturing bus that was relinquished by China as it went through its upgrading of what it was manufacturing. All of that went to Vietnam and Bangladesh and others. There is still an opportunity for us in very specific manufacturing. No one will know this better than you and, and the hero group and everything that all of you represent. That there is an opportunity. Oh, I think Certainly, it looks like we've lost uh, uh, Ramon. There's an opportunity for us to grab a very major share of essential manufacturing that exists that could come out of China. And that is up for grabs right now. And I think India has to be bold and decisive at this point in time and not necessarily be soft handed and terribly diplomatic. Uh, right. No expert, yeah. but I was yeah. reading one book, sorry, uh, The Fractured Himalaya by Nirupama Rao. I was reading her book about India, Tibet, China. It's fascinating. And we lost Tibet so much because we were soft. And I think this is our chance. It is the Asian century. This is our chance to make it real and take leadership position. Right. So uh, I thought I saw Suresh Prabhu there, but his, his name has dropped off. I see Frank is there. So uh, so thank you, Frank, for, for setting up an amazing uh, conference of, uh, of an endless list of very impressive speakers. So thank you very much for, for doing this. Uh, Harsh, let me come to you now a little bit on India now. India was both appreciated and criticized for what people call the vaccine diplomacy. I'd like to understand a little bit of where you stand and I have a second part to this question. I'm going to request both of you to keep your answers uh, as short as you can so we can get more stuff in because we have only till 2.45 for this session. Uh, so uh, the second one is this one world, one, one grid. Is that a potential reality? So start with on the vaccination. I too mm -hmm. was a little confused when, uh, when a, uh, a lot of voices were being heard that we were exporting our vaccines and not administering it in India, etc. Uh, I would like to say two things. One is I think uh, in the balance uh, as we see it now, and I think it's wiser by hindsight, I think it was very good what we did because we built a certain amount of goodwill and we are also able to vaccinate our people in a fairly speedy way in the last uh, six months or so. The second point, which is a little controversial, is the fact that I was talking to some epidemiologists and they were of the view that when they did a zero survey in Delhi, they found nearly 90% plus people had one way or the other got COVID. And this was in two months ago. So this means that it is not just the vaccination that has helped, but also a certain level of herd immunity. Now, probably we, when we see these uh, cases rising in Europe and some other cities uh, of the world, we also understand that maybe no country can really go unscathed by the blast of this virus. Uh, it's a combination of vaccination, it's a combination of post-COVID medication and a combination of herd immunity that will actually ultimately relieve us from this menace. So I think every society will have to take some element of this brunt. It's, it's unfortunate, it's painful. Those of us who have lost loved ones, it's terrible. But I think this is the nature of this disease and it's probably inevitable. So looking at uh, the thing in balance, I personally feel that uh, we have probably tread the middle path uh, in a reasonable manner. I, I'm not sure there's, this is the perfect answer, but uh, I think given this, uh, uh, in hindsight, I feel that we did the right thing. Uh, coming to your second part of the question, you mentioned about what, uh, the one belt, one road? What did you one grid. No, one grid. The announcement that uh, Prime Minister Modi made recently. Okay. Well, I think ultimately we are going to a world which is uh, fairly interconnected and uh, it's going to be more and more interconnected, whether we like it or we don't like it. Uh, I suppose that's an inevitable 
requirement of the way the world will move and i i doubt whether we can really go in any other direction right so uh promo let me come to the other side of movement so clearly uh, the world is getting connected but at the same time we are seeing a push back from countries towards globalization my nation first my people first jobs in my country uh, that's happening in many many places uh, overtly covertly um, tariff barriers non tariff barriers so there are a whole host of issues coming up in your direct business services it's much harder to hold it back through uh, through uh, political and, and uh, physical barriers because we are tends to travel but let's talk a little bit about people and goods physical movement i remember 2004 or 5 we took a car rally from assam all the way to singapore and actually then to a little island rekha might remember this this is dan cii to a little island of indonesia which is just off singapore and this was done with asean just to show that we are actually all connected and and this to my mind will be a very big uh, requirement uh both in reality and also symbolically right now as india wants to play its role as the big brother in the region how do you deal with people how do you have goods and people uh moving across freely in a friendly manner yes what are our real possibilities absolutely sunil um so i think we have to once again really focus on looking east far more than we do in terms of looking west we have always looked west because that's where the biggest markets are and that's where our services markets are right for instance even our manufacturing markets are the biggest markets but we have to start looking east because i think that is a huge market we have one ignored for a long time to the economic cooperation i hope that india can lead the charge and you know if suresh prabhu was here he would be ideally placed to talk about this then i see his name uh, it seems to have joined i don't know whether it's him or just his connection his office That's connected up us but because i think if we can set up global economic cooperation especially across southeast asia i think that becomes a very important element of this region becoming an economic powerhouse in itself which it must right now we're all fighting for ourselves we are all fending for ourselves two the influence of china on these areas is profound we must remember that you know the influence of china in hong kong of course it's it's part of china uh, in other countries it's always going to be very profound so it's not a question of unseating them but it's a question of demonstrating that we have aligned interest in forming those cooperation particularly sunil in the services area i think there's an opportunity for all our services businesses to combine together and serve the rest of the world it would we're increasingly seeing that happen at to be able to serve other parts of the world from parts where collectively philippines was already there but for instance indonesia uh, thailand malaysia all of those countries start coming in, including our immediate neighbors of sri lanka and and bangladesh so i think setting up those modes of cooperation making them real to your point and that's the key and it's a bit, i look at nafta uh, to be honest I've, we've been there uh, we did work through nafta with our uh, offices in mexico and varez in those days being served out of america it was seamless right we could go back and forth all the time it was absolutely seamless so we need to try and aim for some very lofty ideals like that which allow really seamless movement i think it's far away but i think right, we right. there were there were many countries in in europe which actually had removed the check and this is before it became eu they actually removed the check on the borders you could just drive across Without, that's right without, without anyone, anyone even standing there to check uh, can i ask if mr suresh prabhu is 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 in the system can he can he come on okay clearly he's not so uh, let me go to another uh, uh, piece which is kind of changing the chessboard of the region right now the game has changed the big game that we talk of has completely been cured by, the, by what happened in afghanistan so and india as as both of you know had a big play in there india was one of the large investors in infrastructure and helping set up the parliament helping regulations helping train many of the parliamentarians there were lots of things india was doing setting up schools hospitals and and uh, still india was not seen as the top key player and clearly at this moment we got sidelined because our relationship with the taliban was non existent to a negative one 
So do you think it's time for us to start looking at doing business with the Taliban? And I mean, not just literal business, but also uh, political business. And I mean, actually both. Harsh, would you like to take a shot of it? Or actually both of you. Uh, this is this is a subject I think which is increasing, uh, getting increasing import, increasingly important for us. So Sunil, by you uh, set us with a googly, I think. Uh, hmm. Even even the government of India is at this moment uh, in uh, in a flux as to what exactly it should do, and certainly uh, I won't be able to uh, throw much light on it except to say that. Uh, we will need to engage with Afghanistan. I'm not quite sure we, we, I should say that we need to engage with Taliban. But Afghanistan has been a long time friend of India. We've had a lot of goodwill amongst people to people and historical connect. We've obviously got lost somewhere in this entire politics of the region. And the fact that now China and Pakistan have a major role to play there. But... Uh, we definitely need to find a way to establish that goodwill back with the people of Afghanistan. Whether Talib Taliban is the route that we should hold hands with or not, I frankly uh, don't have enough information to be able to comment on it. So, would you like to take a shot at this, Pramod? Yeah, I, Sunil, I don't think there's a choice. I, 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 you know, to be honest, I mean, I don't know what we're laying it for. Taliban is not going away. They're firmly in charge. By the way, the Americans are dealing with them. They may say we don't want to deal with them, but they are dealing with yeah. them every day at all sorts of levels. The Europeans are all dealing with them. So I don't think we should... Um, we have to deal with them because they represent... They are part of our neighbors. They have the power to threaten our boundaries. They have a huge influence around us. Um, and I don't see anybody else coming in to take their place anytime soon. I think the world has washed, uh, has walked away from Afghanistan in the most horrible fashion that we could have possibly imagined. I think it will cost Biden the presidency perhaps at some point in time. But we have to deal with who's there. It's way too important for our geopolitical positioning and our security. We must. So to be fair, I, I do think the Indian system is making those moves right now. Yes. Uh, yes. Even as we speak. Uh, to reach out, to build bridges and, and have some form of a communication where uh, you can actually start to to interact and deal with them. Yeah. Um, let me let me then go to another set of friends or non-friends or old friends or new friends. Um, on the one hand is this situation in Afghanistan. The other hand, Russia has been India's long-term ally since a very, very long time. Since the Crimean uh, issue, it kind of got pushed into the corner and in, in some sense embraced China tighter than it has for a long, long time. And which in some sense, in effect, moved it a little bit away from India. Now, one, I think it's important for us to, to understand and figure out the short term and the long term implication of that for India and for Asia. And then now I want to come to Japan after this. Like, why don't you guys uh, uh, react to this first? Harsh, you want to go? <laughs> I'll, I'll go after you, Pramod Bhai. <laughs> <laughs> so Russia is such a conundrum, isn't it, Sunil? Such a conundrum. And has been over the ages, right? They, they continue to defy the world and they continue to confuse the world, <laughs> if I may use that word. Yeah. And... And we should be very close to Russia if we can be. But, you know, economic, doing economic business with Russia has always been difficult. Um, again, we've been trying to do business with them recently, spent a lot of time there. Um, in the area of business practices, lots of the things that we would consider to be the norm. It is hard. It is hard to understand how Russia works in many respects. So it's a little bit of a black box and without the transparency that you would want. But it is a massive economy. For instance, interestingly, so I'll take a, if I may take a divergence here, something else. they have some of the world's best software architects, artificial intelligence people, services people. The world has still is not using them. One of the finest fintech companies, unsecured lenders, largest in the world, is based out of Moscow. Nobody knows about them. So I think there are many ways in which we could cooperate. There are many ways in which we could do this. It's taken a sideline 
But equally, though, I think when you have to choose, and I think many of our companies and businesses economically are making a choice: Do we go to America? Do we go to the West? Do we go to Germany? Do we go to UK? Or do we go to Russia? We end up going to the West because it's so much more familiar, the rules, etc., so much more transparent. And yet, if we could do something with this economy, the size of Russia, with its politics and everything else that happened, I think it would be marvelous. Remember, also, I think we all know Putin is wildly popular. No matter what the world says, in Russia, uh, with, on my recent trips, uh, Sunil, he is wildly popular. They, the more the world laughs at him, the more they love him in Russia. So we have to that to contend with. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Harsh, I'm going to come to you with a different one now. So, uh, we are all aware that India over the last 15 or 20 years has made an active attempt to get closer to the U.S. And the Quad was one clear demonstration of how this seemed to be working. It was quickly followed by what was the new uh, Anglo-Saxon partnership that AUKUS, which, which went and did this deal with Australia and, and then uh, got France all riled up. So, for us, do you think there is a real role that, that uh, or a benefit that India can draw from Quad? Can some trade routes really be open? Can India's influence really uh, uh, be expanded uh, using this as a vehicle? And I don't mean it in a negative way. No, no, of course. I think uh, India will need to engage with the world and Quad is one of the ways to do that. I think uh, we have to be into various groupings to see that we can cooperate as much as we compete and uh, find our space both to export our produce as well as even for security reasons and uh, strategic reasons. So clearly there is a need for India to be more actively engaged. We need to particularly be very actively engaged in our own neighborhood, particularly the countries that surround the Indian Ocean, where I think China is clearly making some uh, more serious moves than, and we should uh, be more pre proactive uh, than we have been in the past. We have to take some bets. We have to take some risk. We have to make some investments. But that's in our long-term strategic interest. I know that we have... Uh, economic headwinds and that's one of the compelling reasons that we need to grow our economy faster because if we are to create our own protection around us we need to have a very very strong neighborhood supported by us and uh, for that our economy has to be very resilient if you see the, in the china story they didn't have any of these expansionist ideas till they became a very serious economy and that's why they are able to take some liberties with other people because they are very self-sufficient and they have a huge amount of trade surplus with most countries. <clears throat> this is not true for India. So I think that's really uh, very important for us to do. So from our conversation, Pramod, it would appear that this entire Asia thing is only about India and China. That, that this competitiveness between the two, and we do recognize in, in terms of economy, China's economy is much larger at this moment. Uh, while we started off around the same place about 30 years ago, today they are they are clearly way ahead of us. In terms of technology, what the kind of work they've done, especially in deep tech, puts them a few decades ahead, ahead of us in technology as well. And they have a unique ability. I remember a conversation uh, uh, at the World Economic Forum by the CEO of Volvo at that time, of course, it subsequently became a Chinese company. He said that I don't mind competition. I can compete with any company in the world, but I can't compete with a country that behaves like a company. Okay. And we have seen that we have seen China do that not once, not twice, on innumerable uh, occasions. Let me shift the, the focus a little bit. What does the rapprochement of the Arab nations with Israel mean for Asia? I, it actually, um, so it's fascinating to me, that question, right? If you go to Dubai, there are lots of Israelis wandering around Dubai, as you know, um, actually looking for places, for startups, for businesses to grow. They came in there very quickly. 
So for us also, that actually eases a lot of the juggling we used to have to do, all the political maneuvering yes. we used to have to do, all the stuff that we would say, we can't do this, we can't say that, etc., etc. I think it takes away some of that political correctness that we were forced into and allows us to behave much more normally. Both for the Middle East and for Southeast Asia and South Asia, uh, Sunil. The one area where I think India would be markedly terrific at, at pr promoting would be in the entire startup area. So in startups, as you know, you're an investor in many of them, right? Um, if we can bridge the gap between startups in the Arab states and India, that's a huge play for us because there are many advantages they bring there, bring the markets, our startups can go there, they can do. Similarly, if we can do the same thing with South Asia and allow their startups also a lot of ability to work with us, I think then you start knitting together a network which is fascinating. The Israeli startup regime, as you know, is fantastic. Um, the best in the world. Their ideas are terrific. You know, some of the ideas they have should be spread across India. Um, things around agriculture, water, preservation, etc. are worthy of, going any, of being placed anywhere in India, frankly. And I think through trade negotiation, associations, agreements, I just hope we can form these associations much more strongly than we've ever done. In the same way, you know, so if I may say this differently, in the same way CII plays a role in India, I wish we had organizations which could play these roles for us with the South Asian countries, as well as, for instance, with the Arab-Israeli states, because I think those would lead to an enormous amount of cooperation and trade, which would be beneficial for both sides. Absolutely. Roundabout answer, but I hope... It, it, no, no, it, it, it's, a, it's a good, it, it's a good uh, answer. So just a, a quick two-part now. I, I see we have about six or seven minutes to go. Uh, Ash, you know, we opted out of the RCEP. Uh, and, and for us, the relationships in the region have got to be about trade, about investments, about economic bridges, about culture bridges, about sports, about theater and music and people traveling uh, on tourism uh, other than pure politics. Uh, so how do you think we are doing on that front to build the people to people bridge and the bridge of econ economy through trade and investment in the region? and beyond the region, because to be a player in Asia, you need to be a player beyond Asia as well. So if I remember correctly, one of the reasons we opted out of RCEP was there was an industry, Indian industry uh, sort of uh, point of view that some of the terms were not uh, equitable or fair. And uh, that was hanging quite heavy on the mind of the people who were negotiating. And then finally, since it didn't materialize into a solution, it kind of got dropped. But having said that, I'm sure there is a space to reopen all of these issues as things change, times change. Uh, maybe there could be some moderation in our view. There could be some reach out from other countries. Frankly, uh, it's an area which I have a very little experience, so I don't know how exactly it works. But I'm sure there is a way. I totally agree with you that we need to have more engagement. Uh, but we also need to be mindful that we can't just sign into any arrangement as a giveaway uh, and then, you know, we lose a lot more than we can gain. So it has to be a, a more calibrated approach. Uh, what is the right balance, whether we achieved it or not in our past negotiations? Well, I don't have the details to be able to answer that. But my sense is that uh, we can keep working towards it. But in the meantime, while the RCEP is... Uh, uh, sort of hanging loose, we can definitely build bilateral relationship with countries and see how we can ease the process, even if the regional kind of uh, thing takes a little while to fructify. So to build India's position, to build India's influence, to build India's role as one of the key players in the region, do you think we should... Uh, stick to the Indian Ocean, Ocean region or do you think we need to go beyond to the Pacific as well? Pramod? I think, Sunil, we have to go beyond. You know, I, I don't know that that region acts as a whole in itself anyway, right? 
I don't think it's homogenous in any fashion. I think different countries there will act differently, will have different allegiances. The impact of China is very large, very profound. The amount of money China is pouring into those countries is also very large. But there are areas where we should be doing more. There are areas like Taiwan, there are areas like Korea, like Japan, which you mentioned earlier, that we must think about because the Japanese want to be our partners. You know, they understand the importance of India. So if I may just hit another point, India is going to rise in importance over the next 10 years continuously because of our growth rate, because of our economy and because of the splinters that Chinese aggression is causing in the region. And I think we must leverage that as best as we can to get into these very strong countries with very strong economy, not just our neighbors, but go well beyond them. And they actually go the other side also into the Arab states because India will gain importance. People need us. We need them. But people really need us because they are all looking for viable alternatives to China. And I don't know that Chinese aggression is going away anytime soon. Right. So, uh, so staying on that, and, and, and we'll take Japan as the last one since we have just three minutes to go. Uh, do you think there is potential and room for India to also be seen as a friendly neighbor by countries like Pakistan and Sri Lanka and Bangladesh and Nepal, and, and not just as somebody who has the size and the muscle that they can use when they need to? Well, uh, well uh, certainly, and I think for every country except Pakistan, it is something that can be done immediately uh, and should be done immediately. Pakistan maybe will take longer because there is a deep state in Pakistan which has a vested interest in keeping anti in the position alive. Uh, maybe it doesn't suit their economic interests, but it suits their political narrative as well as their uh, military kind of uh, position that they have taken. But having said that, I think if we can build and allow people people contact between the countries, uh, we can build a lot more goodwill. And uh, I wouldn't jump into the Pakistan uh, situation very easily. It's very complex. It's very layered. But I would certainly think that reaching out to Sri Lanka, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Bhutan, uh, Bhutan, of course, is a very close friend. Uh, we should do much better than we have done so far. Bhutan, by the way, has also had a complicated relationship over the last three years. Right, uh, absolutely. We've had some ups and downs there as well. Uh, so let's let's close with Japan, uh, uh, Pramod. Now, Japan clearly has a stated position, and this is coming right from the top of both India and Japanese government, uh, to build a, a closer, more enduring uh, and tighter relationship at the political level, at the executive level, and at the business level. Now, Japanese companies have been coming to India for a while. A few of them have also been wildly successful. Yes. But we've not seen a very large number of them become successful companies. Is there some way you think we can help them uh, in this area? I think, Sunil, you know them well <laughs> from... Of course, the joint ventures that you had, <laughs> I think so. A little bit, I should be asking you that since, question. Since I'm the moderator, I'll, ask only the, I'll just ask the question today. <laughs> you know them well, and of course, we've done a lot of business with them. They are fantastic business people, but they take a very long time to make decisions. I think we know that. They are very, they're perfectionists. Uh, they build great products. They build great services. But I think we have to still solve for ease of doing business in India. Uh, so that remains a very large issue for us, no matter what we say. But we really have to solve for that. And that's what I think keeps the Japanese back. For instance, at this point in time, they would love to uh, move so much manufacturing capacity to us. But I think they get stymied. You know, someone like Suzuki was able to get through it. Many others, if they're starting fresh, get stymied by a myriad laws, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and I wish we could show them the way or Indian businesses who are very successful, who know how to do this, could partner with them to show them the way, because I think they would be delighted to be able to do this in a manner that does not have as much friction as they're used to seeing. I really believe that's one of the key reasons. They have a lot of money, which they're willing to put out. So if you talk to most of the NGOs 
as you know, Sunil, if you talk to investors, they are putting in a lot of money in all these areas. Um, it's a very rich country. And I think we are under leveraging our goodwill with them um, because they know what India is capable of. And I wish we would do more. So thank you. Uh, thank you to both of you. And Rekha, thank you. Uh, I think this was a very interesting uh, conversation. We, we ended up covering many, many different aspects of India and Asia and beyond Asia because it's true that you cannot look at India only as a part of Asia. India is increasingly going to be a key player uh, on the global stage and geopolitics alongside the other human elements that we spoke of, uh, economics, people to people, uh, sports and, and trade have to become equally important components of the relationship that we build with the world to give us both an endearing position and an enduring position and to get us to what many of us believe is the rightful place for India and the community of nations. Absolutely. So thank you very much. Well put. Absolutely. Thank, thank you, you for this wonderful conversation. Thank you, thank you all. Mr. Mr. Suresh Prabhu sends his apologies. He has been trying to join, but uh, uh, was not able to. But I think the session went fabulously. And thanks to all the speakers and especially the chair. Uh, thanks for a great session. Thanks for the chair. Thank you, Rekha. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Okay.